Hello, everybody, and welcome to our updated talk on the physiology and mechanics of breathing. Now, this sounds like a step one topic, and it really, really is. If you're taking step one, you need to know everything about this stuff. If you're taking step two or three, then this stuff is going to be your uh, foundation, and it'll be helpful for you going forward. However, the direct physiology of this stuff is not going to be quite as important as understanding how you can apply this and what this stuff tells you about making the diagnosis of a disease. All right, so let's get started. Uh, but first, I just want to plug my Patreon. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get. Uh, it helps offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. I appreciate it very much. Okay, this is what we're going to go over. It looks like a lot, but I promise this will all tie in together and this shouldn't be a super long conversation here. Okay, let's start out with lung volumes. Now, if you've taken step one, this should be pretty familiar to you, uh, but let's just kind of uh, recap a little bit. So what we're looking at here, this uh, blue curve is the volume inside the lungs, the volume of air inside the lungs. And what we're starting out with right here is just normal breathing at rest. Now, the amount of air that you breathe in at rest per breath is called the tidal volume, okay? So that's, you make a regular exhale and a regular inhale, and that amount of air that comes in and out is the tidal volume. Okay, so that gets us to here. Well, now what we're doing is we're asking the patient to breathe in as much as they can. So that gets us up here. Now, the amount of air in between a normal inspiration and a maximum inspiration is called the inspiratory reserve volume. That's not super important, but it's good to know. Okay, now... You start from as much as you can possibly breathe in, so up here, and you exhale as much as you can possibly breathe out. So now you're down here. That volume that you just breathed out is called the vital capacity. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the forced vital capacity. Okay, so that's the vital capacity. Now the total amount that your lungs can possibly hold is called the total lung capacity. That's a good name, right? It sounds just like what it is, the total lung capacity. So now there's a difference between the total lung capacity, which is the total amount of air that your lungs can hold, and the vital capacity, which is the amount of air that you can possibly breathe out with a maximum inspiration. There's a difference. And that difference is called the residual volume. And the residual volume is the amount of air that's left in your lungs after you've exhaled everything you can possibly exhale out. There's always going to be a residual volume left in your lungs. Okay? So... Uh, what are some formulas? Well, first of all, you can probably surmise that vital capacity plus residual volume equals the total lung capacity. And you can rearrange this. So the residual volume is equal to the total lung capacity minus the vital capacity. And the vital capacity equals the total lung capacity minus the residual volume. We're just rearranging these formulas, okay? So this will help you. If you're taking step one, there are a number of other volumes that you're going to need to be familiar with. Uh, but again, my talks are not focused on step one here. So this is what you will, this is, this is more than enough to get you by for any question that you can run into on step two and step three. Okay, now you might also see something like this, where you have time on the x-axis and volume on the y-axis. 
So this is useful for measuring something called the FEV1 to FVC ratio. Now we already talked about FVC, the forest vital capacity, or the vital capacity, which remember going back here, was the total amount of air that you can possibly breathe out with a maximum inhalation. All right, now you might also see a graph like this. And there are a number of ways this can be graphically represented. This is a pretty common way, but I'll show you a couple other ways too. This is a graph that we use to measure the FEV1 to FVC ratio. Okay, so what is that and how does it help? Well, the FEV1 FVC ratio is really useful for determining whether or not we have an obstructive lung disease because obstructive lung diseases make it difficult to breathe out. Now, what is FEV1? Well, FEV1 is the amount of, after a maximum inhalation, so you fill your lungs up as much as you can, it's the amount of air that you can breathe out in one second. Okay, so let's start up right here. So this is a maximum inhalation. We know that this value here is what? The total lung capacity. Well, that's not on here. What is on here? The FVC, the force vital capacity or vital capacity. Well, remember what the vital capacity is? It's the total lung capacity minus the reserve volume. So uh, force vital capacity equals TLC minus... Uh, residual volume. Now that residual volume is right here. And I don't want you to worry about the numbers here. I want you to worry about, um, think about uh, how we're getting these values based on the graph. So the residual volume is the amount of air that's left in the lungs after you've exhaled everything you possibly can. So that's the residual volume right here. And we can see it's about one. Whereas the total lung capacity is about seven. So we can say then that the forest vital capacity is 7.0 liters minus 1.0 liters equals 6.0 liters. Okay, that's the FEC. Well, what's the FEV1? Well, the FEV1 is right here, and we can, you know, just kind of guesstimate that that's going to be right about here or so. Uh, so we can say that we're at about 1.8 liters here, and up here we're at 7 liters. So the amount of air that was breathed out in one second, or the FEV1, is 7 liters minus 1.8 liters, which is 5.2 liters. Now we just have to do the math. So FEV1 is 5.2 liters, FVC is 6 liters, and that gives us uh, 0.866 or 86.6%. Now, the normal value for FEV1, uh, FVC ratio, is greater than or equal to 80%. Okay, so that's what we have here. We're over 80%, so that's normal. If we were below 80%, then we would consider that this is an obstructive disease. So less than 80% is obstructive. And that's basically all the this ratio is good for, is to determine whether or not we have an obstructive disease. So what you would see with an obstructive disease is you'd have a slower slope like this, and you can imagine then one second is going to be up here. This would be a severe case. Um, and you can see then that the uh, FEV1 volume is much smaller, and that's going to make the ratio smaller. Now, these are a couple other ways that this can be uh, this can be shown to you. Um, this one's kind of similar here, um, and then this is a flow volume loop. We'll take a closer look at that in a little bit. All right, now obstructive versus restrictive lung diseases. Both of them will involve some difficulty breathing or some uh, you know, dyspnea or even possibly hypoxia or hypoxemia. Um, so that's what they have in common. With obstructive lungs, lung disease, this is difficulty with expiration. They can inhale fine, but they have difficulty with expiration. As a consequence, they tend to have air trapping. So they have a little bit too much air left in their lungs after a maximum expiration. And this is why you see that barrel chest in patients who have severe COPD. Uh, 
Um, so they have difficulty fully emptying their lungs, and they have difficulty doing it at a fast enough rate. Ergo, the low FEV1. So because of this mechanical obstruction of the airway, we have a low FEV1. The FVC is going to be roughly normal, and so we have a low FEV1 to FVC ratio. Now, there are multiple causes. The two big ones are asthma and COPD. The difference between those two is that if you give a bronchodilator, a short-acting bronchodilator like albuterol, then the asthma will improve. So you should get an increase in your ratio, whereas with COPD, it will not. That's kind of the definition of COPD is that it's an irreversible obstructive lung disease. And there are some other causes, cystic fibrosis and bronchiectasis. Uh, physical exam, you're going to see wheezes, particularly on expiration. Um, you can get rails, and then chest x-ray can show a flattened diaphragm. That's due to that air trapping. You get an increased total lung capacity, increased residual volume. Now, restrictive disease is difficulty with inspiration, difficulty filling your lungs. Your lungs are stiff. They don't want to move. They don't want to fill. And often this is a result of diseased, stiff lung parenchyma. Think pulmonary fibrosis, sarcoidosis, um, anything that makes it difficult to fill your lungs up. Now, there are some other things that can masquerade as a restrictive lung disease. Imagine if an elephant were sitting on your chest. No, I'm not talking about a heart attack. I'm talking it's really difficult to get air in because you've got pressure. On it. So something like obesity can do it. If you're really, really, really overweight and you go and lay down, it can be difficult to breathe. And that's going to mimic a restrictive lung disease. Okay. Uh, some other things, scoliosis, uh, respiratory muscle fatigue. If you know your muscles aren't working properly, it's going to be difficult to fill your lungs. Neuromuscular disorders can do it. Um, so number of, of causes, and we're going to see how we can distinguish the interstitial lung diseases uh, from some of these external causes like scoliosis and obesity and muscle fatigue. Physical exam, crackles, decreased lung sounds, shallow breathing, um, chest x-ray would show a diseased parenchyma. So these are your FEV1, FEC uh, values and total lung capacity values that you would see with an obstructive versus a restrictive pattern. And this is important stuff to know for all three steps. Okay, now let's look at this flow volume loop. So uh, well, first what we want to do is we want to acquaint ourselves with what's on our axes here. So notice here that we're going to start here. This is our... Uh, our residual volume, we've exhaled as much as possible. Notice that the numbers as we go from right to left are increasing. Okay, I want you to notice that. And then on our y-axis, we have flow. Now this is a rate, this is liters per second. All right, so that's important to know. Uh, the further we deviate on our y-axis, the faster air is being brought in or air is being let out, faster. Okay, so let's, this, this gray here is, is we're gonna call it normal, okay? So what happens is we start out, we're going to breathe in as much as we can. So we're following this, we're breathing in faster and faster and faster, and then we're still breathing in, but now we're breathing in a little bit more slowly, and now we're all the way back to um, as much as we can possibly breathe in. So the flow is now zero. Okay, so now what we have uh, is this is basically our total lung capacity right here. Okay, now we're going to breathe out. So as we breathe out, we breathe out faster and faster and faster and faster. And now we're still breathing out, but it's a little bit more slowly. And now we're back to where we started. Okay, this is a flow volume loop, and this is, this is normal right here. Okay, now let's say we have an obstructive lung disease. Remember, obstructive lung diseases are difficulty breathing in or breathing out. Okay, so we're going to start here. I'm going to try to use blue. Um, all right, so typically with obstructive lung diseases, we have a little bit of air trap. And let's say we're dealing with COPD here. So we've got some air trapping. So let's say we start out at four. Okay, don't worry about the numbers. We're just going to pick a number here. 
Okay, uh, so with obstructive lung disease, breathing in is not so much the problem, it's breathing out. So we have a pretty normal inspiratory phase here. So let's say we're like that, it looks pretty similar. Now where the problem is going to be is with expiration. So we'll go up like that, and then what's gonna happen is you're going to have a prolonged expiratory phase. So you've got something like that. Now notice how this line here is concave. And this is what we see with the flow volume loop with obstructive disease, okay? So that kind of that, that curved slope, what that's telling you is it's taking longer, okay? We're taking the longer path, whereas right here, we take kind of a straight path, right? Uh, so what this is telling you is that your FEV1 is low. So that's what an obstructive pattern will look like on your flow volume loop. Okay, now what about restrictive? I'm gonna try to switch this to red here. Okay, so with restrictive, let's say we start right here. Okay, again, don't worry about the volumes here. Uh, with restrictive, what you're going to see is that the volumes are all just decreased. So you end up having a very similar shape to normal, but it's just less volume. So you'll have something like this, and this is, again, very exaggerated here. So you get something very similar, just with smaller volumes. So with restrictive lung disease, the big thing that you're gonna notice here is a decreased total lung capacity. You're just not able to bring as much air in. This is an inspiratory problem. Whereas with obstructive, the big problem is the decreased FEV1, and then you also have an increased residual volume, and um, typically you have an increased total lung capacity, but it's that FEV1, that decreased FEV1, that's really gonna give it away. Okay, back to black. All right, now let's move on to the AA gradient. This is going to be really helpful for you. Okay, now the AA gradient is the difference in partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli from the partial pressure of oxygen in the pulmon pulmonary capillaries or the, the, uh, the, well, I guess they would be the, the pulmonary veins, but um, it's the amount of the partial pressure of oxygen that you have in your blood after uh, the uh, pulmonary arterioles have been perfused, okay? So uh, this PaO2 is easily measured with arterial blood gases. But how do we measure, how do we measure the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen? Well, unfortunately, we have to measure it indirectly. Okay, so this is alveolar right here. I'll just write that so you know, that's the big A. Um, all right, so we can measure this indirectly. And the formula that we use is 150 minus 1.25 times the arterial part pressure of CO2, which that is also measured with ABGs. Now, the actual formula is a little bit different um, so where we get this 150 from actually has to do with the, f the uh, fraction of oxygen times the uh, barometric pressure. The, the, uh, it's, it's actually the barometric pressure minus the partial pressure of, or the pressure of water um, vapor. So uh, basically the reason we can use this 150 is because as long as we're on Earth, uh, as long as we're at a relatively constant altitude, uh, it's going to come out to be about 150, okay? So I don't want you to worry about that. You can just use 150 minus 1.25 times PaCO2, okay? So what we end up having here is this formula, and we can measure this because we can measure the PaCO2 and the PaO2 through our arterial blood gases. So this here is the PaO2, a P big AO2, and this here is the P little AO2. And now we can determine our, L, or our AA gradient. So what is the AA gradient? Well, normally, 
the AA gradient is 5 to 15 millimeters of mercury. Now, the actual normal value is actually age divided by 4 plus 4, and that's in millimeters of mercury. Uh, but if you're talking about, you know, a 40-year-old, then it can be up to 15. If you're talking about an 80-year-old, then, you know, do the math. It can be up to 24. Um, so you do have to take age into consideration, but for our purposes, we're going to say 5 to 15. So elevated, then, is going to be greater than 15. Now, what do we know then? If we have an elevated AA gradient, what that's telling us is that there is inefficient gas exchange. And this can be due to a number of reasons. But basically what it's telling us is that yes, we may be perfusing the, or we may be perfusing the lungs, we may be ventilating, but gas is just oxygen is just not properly um, getting into the bloodstream or the blood after uh, leaving the lungs, after leaving the alveoli, is not properly oxygenated. So what this can tell you is that you may have dead space ventilation. So in other words, we're ventilating without perfusing. Um, so that could be things, that could be due to things like asthma. It could be due to COPD or you could even get it from pneumonia, okay? Another way that this could be caused is through alveolar hypoventilation. So this could be things like uh, fibrosis, interstitial lung disease. And then another way that this can happen, that you can get elevated A gradient, is through a right to left shunt. Now what's that telling you? What that's telling you is that blood that's deoxygenated is mixing with the oxygenated blood. So in this case, there was no problem uh, necessarily with, uh, with getting air to the bloodstream. The problem here could be that you're mixing deoxygenated blood, normally deoxygenated blood, with the blood that you just oxygenated. Now, what is going to stand out here? What's going to stand out here is that if you were to give oxygen, so if you gave uh, oxygen, you would not correct because it doesn't matter how much oxygen you're bringing in, that is not the problem. The problem is that you're having deoxygenated blood mixing with oxygenated blood and all the oxygen in the world is not gonna fix that, okay? So that's one of the things that's going to tell this apart. If you have an elevated AA gradient and it's not improving with oxygenation, then what you probably have is a right to left shunt. Uh, if it does improve, then you may have a dead space ventilation or alveolar hypoventilation. Okay, now there's one more thing that's going to be really important, and that is the CO diffusion capacity. So I'm going to draw a little picture here. This is our alveolus. And then I'm going to try to switch to red. This here is our capillary. Okay, so we're bringing air in. Here comes the oxygen. And that oxygen needs to get into the bloodstream. All right, so what the CO diffusion capacity tells us is basically we're taking CO in and it's doing the same thing as oxygen. It comes in and it's supposed to diffuse into the bloodstream. Now, the nice thing about the uh, CO diffusion capacity when we measure it is we're able to pick out shunts because you're not going to have mixing of carbon dioxide because you don't originally have carbon dioxide. So it's all going to stay the same. All right, now what would be a way that we could block this process? Well, if we were to have pulmonary edema, that would do it. What's another way? 
What if we had pulmonary fibrosis? That would block diffusion. Or well, let's say we have pulmonary hypertension and we have thickening of the capillary walls. That would cause a problem with diffusion. And then one more. What if we have everything's normal, but we have less alveoli? Or in other words, we have less space, less surface area. That would decrease the amount of carbon, di uh, carbon monoxide that can uh, diffuse. If I've called this carbon dioxide, I'm sorry, I meant carbon monoxide. Uh, so that would decrease the amount of carbon monoxide that can diffuse or the amount of oxygen that can diffuse. So uh, there are a number of ways that this can happen. So pulmonary hypertension with thickened capillary walls, pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary edema, and uh, the last one is emphysema. And there are a lot of other causes, but these are the big four. So now this is an algorithm that you can, you know, look out and, and, and print if you want. Uh, but basically what this is starting with is you've got a patient maybe with difficulty breathing or hypoxemia. And so you start out with spirometry. And the first question you're going to ask yourself is, is the FEV1 to FEC ratio normal? And here they're using 0.7 or 70%. You can also use 80%. Um, I, I would stick with 80%. Um, so the question then is, are you below 80% or not? If you are, if you are below 80%, then um, what you have then is uh, an probably an obstructive process. If you are above 80%, what you probably have is a restrictive process, but you have to look at your, your pulmonary function tests. And that's what this is getting at with the total lung capacity here. So um, what you can see here is, let's say that you have a restrictive lung disease and you measure the DLCO, and that DLCO was low, then you have an interstitial lung disease. Whereas if the DLCO is normal, then what you have is a chest wall or neuromuscular disorder. Remember, we were talking about things like obesity and scoliosis and, um, you know, maybe like myasthenia gravis or something like that. Uh, so naturally, the DLCO in, in that, because there's no problem with the lungs, the lungs themselves are normal, the DLCO is going to be fine. Whereas with interstitial lung disease, we have that fibrosis here. And so that's going to cause the DLCO to be low. Now, with obstructive lung diseases, I'm not going to consider here mixed lung disease because it's a little complicated. Um, we can also look at the DLCO. If the DLCO is low, then we have emphysema. And remember, we talked about that. That's right there. Whereas if the DLCO is normal, then what that's telling you is that the tissue itself is, for the most part, normal. So what you could have is a non-emphysematous COPD, or you could have asthma. And obviously, the way that we're going to differentiate that is based on the, uh, by giving albuterol. And if it reverses with albuterol, then, um, then you know that you have asthma because COPD will not reverse, okay? All right, so this is just a recap of what we talked about here, obstructive versus restrictive. Hopefully now you have an understanding of uh, of, of this, uh, what you need to know for your exam is the FEV1 to FEC ratio. You need to know the AA gradient and what that means. And you should probably know something about the DLCO. If you're taking step one, you need to know all your formulas, unfortunately. But for step two and step three, this will be enough. Uh, just to recap a few definitions, hypoxemia is a state of uh, low oxygen in the blood. Hypoxia is low oxygen in the tissue. So those commonly get confused. Hypercapnia is high CO2. And that may be due to respiratory factors. Um, so if you're not exhaling enough, if you're not ventilating enough, 
Uh, it can be due to cardiac causes. If the heart is not pumping, then you're not going to be able to get that CO2 out because it's not going to make it to the lungs. Or it could be due to metabolic causes. Remember to differentiate between respiratory and metabolic acidosis. We talked about the AA gradient that measures the efficiency of gas exchange between the alveolus and the artery. An elevated AA gradient indicates that the hypoxia is due to a respiratory problem. And then the DLCO test, or um, uh, carbon monoxide diffusion, tests the ability of carbon monoxide to diffuse across the alveolus and parenchyma, and a low DLCO indicates a disease either of the alveolus, like with emphysema, or of the parenchyma, which would be like fibrosis or edema.